straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Chad Debo pleads not guilty to murder charges as Lori Vallow Debo is ordered committed to a mental health facility. Our legal analysis on the latest twists and turns in the doomsday cult couple saga. A murder defendant breaks down while admitting to killing his five-year-old son. But with his confession now recanted, what will the jury believe? Hey, Joe. He is. He's in heaven. Plus, did a murder victim admit to being an alibi for a real estate heir accused in his wife's disappearance? The shocking testimony in the trial of Robert Durst. And her stepping in, making a phone call, mm -hmm. and leaving it as a... Daybell, ...as well as the two children of his current wife, Lori Vallow. Mr. Daybell, in this case, then, you were brought before this court to answer for the indictment filed in this case, which is which alleges you've committed serious crimes in that eight felony charges have been filed in the grand jury's indictment. The bodies of seven-year-old Joshua J.J. Vallow and 16-year-old Tylee Ryan were discovered one year ago buried in Chad's property. Debo faces up to the death penalty, but prosecutors have not yet said if they'll seek the highest sentence if convicted. Very well, not guilty pleas are entered as to all the counts in the indictment. Lori also faces charges of murder and fraud, but a judge has now ordered her committed to a mental health facility for up to 90 days. Prosecutors are no longer contesting a psychological assessment, deeming Lori incompetent to stand trial. And defense attorneys for Lori are asking the court to show why one of Lori's friends should not be held in contempt for failing to comply with their subpoena. She secretly recorded phone calls with Lori, which have been handed over as evidence. If you really loved me, you wouldn't have told the police that I had JJ with me. That's not, that's not what a friend does. I do, and I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. Joining us today is New York Law School professor Kirk Burkhalter and Terry Austin. Kirk, up until now, Chad and Lori Daybell were going to be tried together. Chad was arraigned alone. Could this be the beginning of this, this trial being split in two? Oh, it certainly could. So uh, Lori uh, seems that she will be unfit to stand trial, and that won't occur anytime soon. So prosecution, the question is, how long would they wish to delay the trial of Tad? You have these heinous crimes, children involved, and certainly the prosecution absolutely would like to move forward. This may present some problem for the prosecution when you have two people acting in concert as such. However, I suspect we'll see this case move forward with just Chad. I can see that as well. Terry, does the prosecution not challenging Lori Vallow Daybell's competency tell us anything? And what happens next for her? You know what, Brian? I was actually shocked that the prosecution didn't, you know, object to this. This is a huge issue, and it really could delay the trial, but maybe would thought it would be futile to object to it. Even the indictment itself said that Chad and Lori were endorsing these religious beliefs, that they believed that Tammy was possessed by spirits, and so maybe would recognize the fact that objecting to it wasn't going to change anything. And it means that she is going to be put into the care of the Department of Health and Welfare, and she's going to undergo treatment until she's restored to her mental competency. And if that doesn't happen, they'll just keep getting extensions until, in fact, she is found to be competent to actually stand trial, whenever that might be. Yeah, and as we understand with that, it's going to be like a 90-day process. So they have 90 days, maybe they extend it more, and it can be extended almost indefinitely depending on our competency. But of course, we've got you covered and we'll let you know how that plays out. Now to California, where two people accused in the death and cover-up of a six-year-old boy will remain in jail for now. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with the latest on the murder of Aiden Leos. Anjanette? Brian, Marcus Aries and Winley made their first court appearances. Uh, Aries is charged with shooting and killing Aiden Laos, and Winley is accused of helping cover up the crime. Despite objections from their attorneys, the judge allowed cameras to record the arraignment for Marcus Aries and Winley. Prosecutors argued for a high bail. I'm asking for that for three reasons. The first being the seriousness of the crime. The second being... He's a danger to the public. And the third is his flight risk. The Orange County District Attorney says Aries fired his gun from the white Volkswagen Lee was driving on a freeway back on May 21st. Aiden was shot sitting in his booster seat. A manhunt followed for the vehicle involved and the people inside. As a mom, I just, my heart was breaking the moment that we found out about this heinous crime. Tips and donations for a reward poured in. We all related to this situation of just driving our little boy to school and suddenly he's dead. 
crying, Mommy, my tummy hurts. Aiden's mother held her son as he died and remembered him at a memorial service. To my Aiden, I love watching you sleep in the morning as you're the most beautiful boy I've ever seen. As the court case moves forward, a judge ordered Marcus Ariza's bail set at $2 million when Lee's is $500,000. Just looking at the charging document, Mr. Eris is the danger and the potential greater risk to the community. Now, both Ariz and Lee will be back in court next week for the remainder of their arraignments. At that time, the judge said he could either raise the bail amounts or lower them. The judge actually set the bail higher than allowed by the guidelines or called for by the guidelines at the request of the prosecutor. Brian? Now, Andrea, is this it for arrests in this case? You know, that is something that the DA addressed uh, when he held a press conference. He said that there's a lot of chatter on social media, people calling for more arrests in this case, speculating and saying that other people had to have helped cover for these two. But he said right now they have no evidence that anyone else but Ariz and Lee were involved in this case. And uh, they've asked that people leave the family members alone because they do not believe they were involved. Yeah, I would guess that this case is still ongoing as they're trying to see any leads or people who may be connected with this. But so far, do the charges make sense as to how they're being applied in this case, Anjanette? Yeah, I would say so, so far. You know, the DA said that they initially charged Win Lee with murder. Uh, then they backed off of that. When they filed the formal charges with the court, they filed, um, her, they charged her as an accessory after the fact. So they certainly said they don't have the evidence right now to charge her with murder. A reason they feel they can prove, and they called it a rock solid case. All right, we'll see how that plays out. Thank you, Anjanette. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, did a Wisconsin woman murder her friend with. Welcome back. A Tennessee man broke down while admitting to killing his five-year-old autistic son. Now on trial, he's recanting that confession, but prosecutors say he gave it of his own free will. What made you stop? Well, I not realize. The two and a half hours of the four-hour interview was played for the jury. Was it an accident? No. Joe? No. Was it an accident? I did not beat him. So you intentionally did it? Daniels told many variations of what happened to baby Joe with one consistency. It all started when baby Joe peed on the floor. I saw baby Joe. He was laughing. He had peed on the floor. I was not happy about that. I love my boy so much that I won't do anything. Well, you don't because you know where he's at. And you're not having to find him. I don't know where he's at. Yes, you do. I don't want the door. I push the coffee. I didn't push the coffee table out of the way in a weird way. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. In a little battle, I may have spanked him. Finally, Daniels confessed to hitting the boy over and over. Was he crying? Yeah. How long do you think that lasted for? Five, ten minutes. He kept screaming the whole time. Daniel said he placed the boy's unresponsive body in a field, crossing his arms across his chest. He attempted to bring police to baby Joe's body, but the five-year-old's remains still have not been found. On cross-examination, Agent Joey Boyd of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation asked about inconsistencies in Daniel's confession with the evidence. He said that he struck him in the head, in the back, and also in the face. Is that correct? Next question is, and would it surprise you not to find some blood in that area? Uh, my answer, it would not surprise me, given the age of Joe Clyde, his stature. So you don't believe Joseph Daniels beat Joe Clyde Daniels to the point that he bled? I can't prove that. So he could very well be in line to try to satisfy what you wanted? No, sir. I don't believe that's the case. Daniel's wife, Crystal Daniels, is also facing charges and is set to stand trial at a later date. Agent Boyd says both parents are to blame for baby Joe's death. And both of those choices would make him a murderer, yes or no? Uh, yes, sir. I, I would describe them both uh, that way.
Back with us is New York Law School Professor Kirk Burkhalter and Terry Austin. Terry, prosecutors know what the defense is going to argue, so what about this confession is going to make it stick? You know, Brian, in my opinion, the confession is definitely going to stick because it was not coerced. First of all, we know that Daniels came to the police station on his own accord to confess. The confession was not that long. I mean, it was four hours. We've seen longer confessions. We saw in the Christian Bahena Rivera case, it was 11 hours, and that one stood ground. So, in fact, that was a conviction. And, you know, we also saw here that the interrogators, they were actually saying that they had information, but they did not put words in his mouth. So I definitely think that the confession, the confession is definitely going to stand up. I don't think that it is going to be found to be coerced or be a false uh, confession. All right, Kirk, positive confrontation, move towards uh, acknowledgement and repeat admissions of guilt. This is textbook read technique in this interrogation. Can the defense argue this is a part of their false confession? Well, certainly the defense will attempt to argue. The problem is the Supreme Court has upheld all types of interrogation techniques, uh, interview techniques. Uh, police can lie. They can present uh, information, evidence that they don't have. As Terry just mentioned, we've seen interrogations and interviews far longer than this. So this is the kind of pseudo good cop, good cop, uh, bad cop type uh, confession. Uh, I think the, the defense will argue it. However, um, they're not going to win that argument. This is done over and over, and it was not coercive. It was not coercive at all. It was voluntary, and that's the key. Yeah, we're definitely, I think at least, I think we're all on the same page. We're definitely going to probably see a case put on by the defense. If they're going to make this argument, there's going to be someone making the arguments to exactly what we're going to talk about. It's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Thank you both. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, R. Kelly puts the keys in his ignition and is breaking up with his attorneys. Plus, a story of espionage, political corruption, and mob-directed assassination attempts. Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross reports on the division of light and power next. We're back. A woman in Wisconsin is now under arrest for allegedly murdering her friend with eye drops. Jesse Kershewski called police saying her friend, 60-year-old Lynn Hernan, was dead in October 2018. Hernan's death was initially ruled as a drug overdose. Prescription pills and crushed medicine were found around her body. Police now say Hernan's death was a homicide. According to a police report, Kershewski posed as the victim's friend, taking over $300,000 from her, then spiking Hernan's water bottle with a lethal level of eye drops. The 37-year-old is charged with intentional homicide and felony theft. Also in Wisconsin, a former pharmacist will spend three years in prison for sabotaging vials of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. Stephen Brandenburg admitted to spoiling 500 doses of the vaccine at a hospital in Grafton. Brandenburg pled guilty to two counts of tampering with evidence for leaving the vials outside last December. Prosecutors say he believed in conspiracy theories and intentionally tried to ruin the vaccines because he didn't believe they were safe. 57 people received doses of the vaccines from the vials before Brandenburg was discovered. R&B singer R. Kelly is trying to fire his criminal defense attorney, Stephen Greenberg. R. Kelly appeared in court in New York on Wednesday, two months before the anticipated start of his trial for racketeering charges. The judge asked Kelly if he wished to dump Greenberg and co-counsel. The singer replied, quote, absolutely, yes, ma'am, your honor. Kelly is currently in jail in Chicago, awaiting two separate trials there for accusations of filming himself having sex with underage girls. Greenberg has previously appeared on the Law & Crime Network defending Kelly. Uh, obviously, the law of averages is going to catch up with us at some point. But, you know, it, it's, it's this sort of buyer's remorse. In many of these cases, with many of these allegations, these were people that were ecstatic to be with R. Kelly. They were happy to be with R. Kelly. And now someone else has said to them, oh no, it was no good, times have changed. And, and in hindsight, they're sort of repurposing the encounters. A new book is out this week digging into the mafia's influence in Ohio during the 1970s. Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross has more. Thanks, Brian. Coming up this week on Brian Ross Investigates, the never-before-told tale of corruption, powerful interests, and mafia hits 
told by a man who was at the time the youngest mayor of a major American city ever, Dennis Kucinich of Cleveland, who I covered when I was a young reporter. I was really lucky to get out of there alive uh, during that time. Uh, you talk about shots fired into your home right there in that house? Yeah, right, uh, right behind me uh, on the wall on the left, there was a high-powered rifle shot that, uh, uh, that went through the place where I was sitting. And had I not moved a split second earlier, it would have uh, hit me. That's coming up this week on Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Back to you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. When we come back, did Susan Berman admit to covering... Welcome back. One of the witnesses in the murder trial of Robert Durst now says the victim once claimed to be the alibi for the real estate heir accused in his wife's disappearance. Susan Berman was shot to death in her home in December 2000. Prosecutors say her best friend Robert Durst killed her because she threatened to go public with what she knew about Durst's involvement with his wife's missing since 1982. The daughter of Berman's former boyfriend says she met Berman when she was in the sixth grade and they became incredibly close. She then described the conversation she had with Berman when she was in the eighth grade. She was, you know, it was just another interesting story she was telling me, and she was telling me about um, her friend and how his wife had disappeared and how she had been an alibi or made a phone call for him so that it wasn't suspicious. And um, she left it kind of like a cliffhanger, I, you know, I was, she left me in suspense, like, did he do it? And she kind of smirked and said, I don't know, you know, what do you think, kind of thing. Who was she talking about? Bobby Durst and his um, wife, Kath Kathleen. Okay, well, did she use the word Kathleen or did she just say his wife? Uh, I, I can't really remember at this point. How certain are you that Susan Berman told you that she helped her friend Bobby with this situation by providing some sort of an alibi? Completely. Is there any doubt in your mind? No. On cross, the defense asked her if she previously described her memory of this conversation as foggy. I don't remember saying that, but I'm sure it's true. Okay, so you're 13 years old or 14. At one time you said this happened when you were 13. Just now in court you said it happened when you were 14. But it's fair to say, when you think about it, all the facts as to what happened are, as you described it previously, foggy, not clear, not detailed. Not all. Not all, mm -hmm. but at least some, correct? Some, okay. yes. Kirk, fading memories is going to be at the heart of the defense's argument. How did this witness come across to you? I think she was quite credible. You know, you can remember that you wore that particular tie or that suit, but you just don't remember what day or what restaurant. Was it at this restaurant or the other restaurant? But certainly you remember you wore that tie because you got soup on it. And she comes across credible. She remembers this event, doesn't remember exactly how old she was, 13, 14. She's better than me, 13, 17, who knows, right? So, but I, I do think that she was quite credible and it's always good when witnesses admit that their memory was foggy instead of trying to cover it up. I think that adds to the credibility here. Now, Terry, to, to Kirk's point, the witness seemed pretty sure of a few things. How do you think the jury will read this witness? I think the witness, like Kirk said, is going to be believed by the jury. And remember, Brian, she's not the only witness who said that Susan Berman told her that she did a favor for Durst. And by the way, this is all hearsay on top of hearsay. Judge Wyndham apparently just allows everybody to say anything they want to say. But the other witness is Miriam Barnes, and she's a friend, and she said that Susan Berman told her the same thing about a phone call. And so this is an important piece for the prosecution. They're trying to show that there was some motive for Durst to kill Berman. And the motive was that Berman knew about Kathy Durst and that apparently Durst killed Kathy. And so it's very important for them to establish that Susan Berman was really talking about this phone call that she made to different people. So I think it's an important part of the prosecution's case. And I think that Melly Kaufman and, frankly, Miriam Barnes both came across as very credible witnesses.
Terry, you mentioned the hearsay issue. Do you think it rises to the level of potentially being an appellate issue that could have this case overturned if Durst lives that long? Yes, absolutely. I think there are so many instances in this case where that could be a grounds for appeal. All right, thank you both for joining us, and thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.